And Father, what a privilege to serve you. What a privilege to know that we are worthless without you. What a privilege to know that only you can minister where the soul and spirit meets in our hearts. Only you can make a difference. And Father, in the mighty name of Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray that this morning you will take what is read and shared and I pray that you would minister profoundly. Even now I ask that hearts would be soft to receive, that ears would be wide open to hear, and that you would take your glory. For we ask this in the name that is above every other name, Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. and amen. It's been my privilege to serve the Lord now for some 40 years. 40 years I've lived by faith, and when I say I live by faith, I really do. I don't get a salary. If God doesn't provide, we don't survive. It's been that for 40 years, and there is no better place to live than in His hands. What a great privilege to serve Him for 40 years and, and to preach the gospel. After 15 years of living by faith, one morning I was in my quiet time and I thought that 15 years living by faith deserved some special 15 years living by faith revelation. So I said, Lord, how about a 15 years living by faith revelation? Rather cheekily I asked for that and as clearly as I ever heard from God, I got a 15 years living by faith revelation. And it was simply this, never forget where I brought you from. Never forget where I brought you from. Never forget who you were and never forget that I did it. You know, my response was, Lord, Surely you can do better than that. I was a fiery charismatic. Surely you can do better than that. And then I allowed the Holy Spirit to minister to me. And I realized just how profound that was. Never forget where I, where I brought you from. I've done it. You've done nothing. Never forget where I brought you from and never forget what you were. Never. I did it. Never forget what a wretch you were. Because if you never forget where I brought you from and that I brought you, you will never stand up there and preach down to anyone. You will always stand up there and preach up to me. You will never preach down to anyone. You will just preach up to me. Never forget Almighty, awesome God, beyond my wildest understandings, far too awesome for me to understand. He saved my low soul. He saved my life. Never to be the same again and never forget that never forget and you know the great challenge to us is to understand that the Christian walk is experiential it's not freaky experiential it's experiential in him we live and move and have our being seek me and you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. It's experiential, but we must understand this. Experience never makes doctrine. Experience confirms doctrine. 
doctrine is in here. You can't make doctrine out of experience. It just confirms the word. Let me read Revelation 2. God is speaking to the church of Ephesus. He says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You've persevered. You've got fancy works. You expose false prophets. You've done all those things. You've got a Bible college. You've got all those things. But you've forgotten about me. You've forgotten about me. It's all about me. It's not about those other things. You need to understand. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, the height, says some of the other translation, the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the first works. Come back to me. Hebrews 3.14 It says, You have come to know Christ if you hold on to the end with the confidence you had at first. You have truly come to know Christ if you hold on to the end with the confidence you had at first. And Jeremiah 2.2 says, I remember the devotion of your youth how as a bride you loved me. As a bride you loved me. We live in a Christian country. I think the statistics say 65-70% of South Africans are Christians. I don't know where we get those statistics of, from. God says by their fruit you will know they are mine. There's no fruit in this land, I'm sorry. Anyway, we claim. And in this Christian country, I was born in this Christian country. Born a Christian, because I think that we think it's hereditary here. And I was born a special Christian because I was born a Presbyterian. And our uh, pastor used to tell us that we were hot Scots. I don't know so much about all that. I travel much, and there are other people that tell me that you get dead, and then deader, and then you find the Presbyterian. <laughs> anyway, I was born a Presbyterian. I had a very good start. My granddad was moderator of the Presbyterian church, and he christened me, and I was brought up in a manse, and I went to Sunday school from that high till I was 15 years old. I don't remember, I think lots of things were done at the Sunday school that had an impact on me, but I never was aware of those things. But I, I knew what was going on. I, th I think, I thought I knew. I was a Christian, and of course I had my very strong views on what was going on in the church. And I had very strong views on the charismatic movement when it started. My wife was an Anglican. And she said that it was a higher church than our church. And I went to a couple of Anglican services, understood even less that was going on. So it's obviously a higher church. <laughs> the higher the church, the less you understand what's going on. Anyway, she finally submitted to the, 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 the Presbyterian Church and we got married and we were Christians. For all, to all intents and purposes, 
we were Christians. And I had, as I said, very strong views on the charismatic things that were all around. So much so that my wife one day went off to one of these meetings and she got born again. And she wasn't in a hurry to tell me because she knew how I would respond to it. So she picked a mellow moment to tell me. I think I was mellow. But she picked this moment to tell me. And I don't remember how I responded, but I think I congratulated her. Like she was joining the country club or something like that. You know how patronizing us men can be. And my wife was over the age of 40 and I thought she was going through some change in life. And that women do strange things at that stage in their life. And I thought it was just one of those things. And you know how patronizing we can be? I said, lovey, it's great you find something in life. Go for it. I'm right behind you. I didn't tell her how far, but I'm right <laughs> behind you. Now, I need to tell you this because it's not an away game. I used to tell the story with my wife here, uh, uh, witnessing it, and she used to. My wife was a nag. She was, in fact, on my own, I thought she was a bit of a nag deluxe. Nye, 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 nye. Of course, there are no nags here, but uh, nye, 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 nye. And, and she used to keep me on the straight and narrow with the nye, 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 nye. And she was obviously very good at the nye, 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 because she kept me under control. We even had an arrangement with the nye, nye, nye. I was a busy guy. I was a CEO of a multi-million company. And obviously very busy. I battled to get home early. I used to get home around about 7 o'clock. So that was 7 o'clock at night. I had to be home before 7. No nye, nye, nye. After 7, nye, nye, nye. And obviously, the later, the more, the nye, nye, nye. It was about two weeks after her conversion when um, I'm, 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 I'm heading home and uh, I'm, 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 I'm thinking uh, about uh, Ines because sh she's got born again and, and something has definitely happened there. But I was thinking about, uh, and I was well after seven, heading home for a nye, 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 deserving to get a nye, nye, nye. And no main man speeds home for a nye, nye, nye. So I was driving slowly uh, home. And we got to the main house. And even as I went down the driveway, I went down the driveway languidly. I was in no hurry because I knew that as I got to the front door and opened the front door, I was going to get it. I got to the front door, opened the front door, and there she was, and there was no nanny. Hi, nice to see you. I stepped back. I think I'm at the wrong house. <laughs> but anyway, I eventually I, I, I go in, and about two weeks later, I have a similar occurrence. I get home, and I'm later this time, but as I get home, it's the same thing. I open the front door. Hi there. How are you? Did you have a tough day? The kids are there. Hi, Dad. Nice to see you. The supper's warm. The beer's cold. It's frightening. I live in a world that tells me that leopards don't change their spots and something's happened in my house. The spots are falling off my leopard. And you know, I watched this. I knew that I knew what was going on, but I didn't want to hear it. I didn't want to hear it. Anyway, eventually I checked out with the kids. I said to Gav, Gav, have you noticed a change with mom? So he said, yeah, yeah, no, I've noticed a change. I know if I checked with the animals, they'd have said the same thing. Something had happened. And I eventually said to her, I said, lovey, what has happened to you? And she said, I told you, I'm born again. The Lord Jesus Christ, by his Spirit, indwells 
me. Now I want to tell you that that's far too complicated for a main man to understand. But the simple bottom line is that when Jesus Christ comes in to a life, that life changes. No change, no Jesus. The love that was coming out of her for the first time in my life and in my marriage, I'm loved and honored in the, the home. Absolutely. I even tried to annoy her. And the more I tried to annoy her, the more love came out of her. And it was more and more frightening. I said to her the one night I was talking to her and I said, you know, you must leave the kids alone. You can't turn the kids into Bible punches. You must let them all just make their own decisions at some stage. And, uh, and then at night I said something about G Jesus. It wasn't too blasphemous. But as I said this about Jesus, she started to cry. Now you might not think that's strange for a woman, but in my 17 years of marriage at that stage, I, I'd never seen her cry in front of me. Maybe she had reason to cry on her own, but I'd never seen. But there in front of me, I, I'd said this, I looked in her face, she wasn't arguing, and she didn't say anything, but there were the tears. And it was almost as if those tears ministered to me, almost as if those tears said to me, Peter, you can say anything you like about anyone. But don't you dare say anything about Jesus. My Jesus. She wasn't just talking about the Jesus that I'd learned about at Sunday school. She wasn't talking about Jesus Christ who heads up Christianity theoretically. She was talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died very specially for her. She was talking about Jesus Christ who changes lives. As I looked into her face and I knew that that was the truth. She believed. She believed. She really believed. It wasn't just intellectual. It wasn't historical. It wasn't emotional. It wasn't hysterical. It wasn't like I believe that the check is in the post hoping that it is, but knowing that it might not. There was a hope, not just a wish. There was an unshakable confidence. She was absolutely sure of what she hoped for. She was absolutely certain of what she did not see. It was radical, it was life-changing, and it was hugely infectious. Because that is what happens when Jesus Christ comes into a home. That is what happens. He is the Son of God. And I knew that I knew. And we do know. We are fighting it. We are fighting. We like to talk about God, but we're fighting the name of Jesus. Because it is the all-changing name. It changes lives. And for two months, two months I fought this. And then she came one Sunday night, she was now going to church, and she actually asked me if I, if I minded if she went to church. I, I think if I said I had, she probably wouldn't have gone, but she said, you know, it, 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 uh, I said, go, go, go. The, uh, the, you know, this is a passing phase in your life. Uh, the sooner you go there, the sooner you'll get over this thing. And she used to go on a Sunday evening to the big charismatic church. And she used to get a lift at quarter past six. But at half past five, she used to go and get ready for the service. And she used to go into the bedroom and she used to start singing praise songs. Jesus, what a wonder you are and all those things. And I want to tell you that name is the name above every other name. And when she was actually singing that name, that name rattled me. It rattled me. The name above every other name. And then came six o'clock this one Sunday evening. She was getting ready. She was singing her hymns. And in those days, there was only one channel on television. And come six o'clock on a Sunday night, South African TV, you likely have to have a Christian program. 
And indeed, there was a Christian program, but they had a special arrangement with Main Mana like me. They played funny Christian music first to warn you that it was coming so that you could turn uh, the TV off. Anyway, the funny Christian music started, and I sat there. I didn't turn it off. I had a beer in my hand. I sat there, and they introduced a panel discussion, cross-questions. And the subject for the evening was the happy clappies. Now, they didn't introduce it like that, but that was the subject as I knew it. And there was Reinhard Bonker. Uh, the, 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 uh, um, uh, there, there was a, a guy, Bill Thomas, he was in charge. But there was Reinhard Bonker, and there was a chap called Stephen Grenfell. I knew him very well from my journalistic days. He was an agnostic, uh, a, a sort of atheist all rolled up into one. He had a real problem with Christians, particularly the charismatic side, and he could really express himself on TV. And I thought, what a boyki, I'll listen to what he has to say. And he started to sound away, and he went for it. He called them self-righteous and, 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 uh, and, and, and uh, critical and all these things. And as he was talking about them, he was just reiterating everything I'd been saying to my wife. And it's great to hear, to have confirmation on television. And I was quite excited to get this. And my wife was busy getting ready to, uh, for the, the church service. And I thought, well, I'll sort her out. And I said, lovey. She was lovely in all circumstances. I said, come, come, come listen. And she came and sat. And she sat and listened to this guy for seven minutes. And I managed to keep quiet for those seven minutes. And I said to her, obviously, what he's saying is true. He's just repeating what I've been saying. And, uh, you know, obviously I'm a prophet in my own land. But when it's on TV, it's truth. But she knew it wasn't and she wasn't very impressed anyway she 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 said then then he finished and the hooter went outside and off she went for her lift and i'm now left in front of this tv set all on my own grenfell's finished it's now the chance of reynard bonker to respond reynard afterwards said that this guy had really annoyed him and he hoped that his annoyance had not shone through but as he started to respond the camera zoomed up to his face and as he started to talk i never heard a single word that he said but as i looked into his face his face just shone at me. And in a simple moment of revelation, as I looked at that man of God, I realized that what was shining out of that man of God was exactly the same as was shining out of my wife. I realized in a simple moment of revelation that the Lord Jesus Christ by His Spirit indwells those who love Him and those who serve Him. In a simple moment, as I looked into his face, I realized that Jesus Christ is for real and he does inhabit the praises of his people. And I realized that the gospel is for real. And as I looked at him, the camera zoomed at, at, at Stephen Grenfell and I looked at Stephen Grenfell sitting in his seat and he just got uglier and uglier and then I had a vision. One minute he was sitting in the chair, next minute he wasn't there anymore and I was sitting in his place and as I looked at myself I saw myself in all my ugliness I saw myself like I was a pig sitting in the gutter sitting in the muck and mire and having the audacity from down there to point upwards and condemn Jesus Christ who I knew in that instant was for real and my whole life came before me my late mom and dad Particularly mom, she would have liked to sit down and write out a CV of her two boys. And my, maybe my CV would read three or four impressive pages. But as I sat in front 
of that, uh, that TV set, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I realized that I could take three or four pages of CV, I could crumple it up, and I could throw it into a waste paper basket were I to stand before Almighty God. It's a mighty shaker. It's a mighty shaker. You're in the process of trying to gain the world something you'll never do. But tragically, you're in the process of losing your soul. You're going to hell. And then it was as if I was asked this question, what have you done with the things I gave you? God is in the people business. He, he blessed me with a wife and four children. What have I done with the stewardship of the things that he gave me? The program finished just after that. I switched it off. I sat there stunned and a few more things happened that evening. But just before midnight that night, I went down to the bottom end of the garden. Just before midnight at the bottom end of the garden. And I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I didn't hear any warm feelings or hear any bells ringing. But I did something that I hadn't done for 25 years. I sobbed and I cried like a baby. And it wasn't just from up here. It was from the pit of me. It was a combination of all things that I can't even begin to describe to you. But I know that at the bottom end of the garden, when I said, Jesus Christ, Lord, I know who you are and I give my whole life. I gave up my independent right to myself down at the bottom end of the garden. And when I walked back into the house that night, I walked back never ever to be the same again. And I know that. I know that it was as determining as that. As I walked back into the house that night, I knew that I would never ever be the same. As I sat in front of the, uh, the, the, that television set, anyone sitting either side wouldn't have heard a word. They wouldn't have seen a thing. But I mean, it's a bit of a shaker. You're an executive director of a multi-million company. You're a chairman of this. You're a president of this. The kids are doing well. You're living in the best suburb in town. People look at the family and they say they're doing well. And you sit in front of the TV set and you realize the truth. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit convicts on sin, righteousness, and judgment and glorifies Jesus Christ. You come to a truth of yourself like the prodigal son. You know, one of the first things, one of the first things I did, my wife had been, I, I, wasn't, I didn't tell my wife immediately what I'd done. You know, us humans, we, we, we're strange. It was like conceding victory. So I, I, I didn't. But she was reading a book on inner healing. And I was loved and honored at home. So there were no more nya nya And I, I, you know, when you're loved and honored at home, you, da you, you don't come home at seven. You get into traffic jam at five o'clock uh, to, to get home. And uh, she'd been reading this book on inner healing. And I, I came home the one afternoon and, and the, there was this book on the, on the main double bed. And I first just checked that she wasn't watching and I, I, I sneaked up to the book. And the book was open on a page and on that page were 60 words describing sin. And when I looked at those 60 words, it was the first time in my life I got 100% in an examination. I, wa I was every one of those things. And outside the Holy Spirit, I wouldn't have confessed that. But as I looked, and I panicked. And I went and I picked up the phone and I phoned May Hauser, who's a counselor at the big church. And I said, May, listen to these words. And I read them out. I said, if I've got to be without these words, I can never be a Christian. She said, Peter, what have you done? There was like a silence. She said, what have you done? She said, have you given your life to Jesus? I said, yes, May on Sunday night. And she said to me, she said, praise God. And then she gave me, gave me the best advice I've ever received in 40 years. She said, don't worry 
about those words. Just keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. And you know the interesting thing about those words, they were all inside words. Words like hate, resentment, pride, jealousy, arrogance. And they were all inside words. When I looked at those words, I realized that that's the real me. That's the me God knows. That's the me Jesus Christ died for. Not the one that I've paraded to the world. And I realized in a very simple way that only Jesus Christ can come into your life and take those words out. Ines had had a major a major influence, you know, after I got saved. I said, love it, we've got to do something about it. So I got a fish, put a fish on my car. And I said to her, we need to get a, a cross. And in those days, there weren't too many crosses available. These days you seem to find crosses all over the place. But this was a few years back. So she went and had a look and there were little crosses like this. And you can't give a big man man, a little cross like that. (laughs) So I said, what are we going to do? She said, you remember when you played in the World Eleven at Lords? You guys won gold medals and silver medals. Why don't you take that silver medal and let's, let's, let's melt it down and make some crosses out of it? So I thought that was very good. I got the, 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 the silver medal at Lords. Lords for the Lord. So I thought that's great. So, so, so Ines took the, the medal, she got it, and we had two big ones and two little ones. The big ones were big. I think even too big for the Pope. But, <laughs> but the, two, the two little ones, and this is one of them, and she gave it to me. And she said, Peter, from Lord's to the Lord. But I want to tell you something about this. I started wearing this cross. And I was still, the Lord had actually said to me, stop drinking. But I was arguing with him. I read that he turned the water into wine. and, 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 And Timothy, have some wine with a meal. And it's not what you eat and drink the circumcision of the heart. So I was still arguing, but I was wearing this cross. But I was still arguing and I was still having a few beers. I said, Lord, a few beers. And God never agreed to that, but I thought that was okay. But I, I was drinking and this cross, every week or so, it used to tarnish. And I used to have to take it off and clean it. Seven months later, I finally came to conviction. I never touched another drop of alcohol and this cross never tarnished again. From Lord's to the Lord. Anyway, I've now met Jesus. Six years later, I gave up my fancy job. CEO of a multi-million company. Everyone, what are you going to do? You you must be crazy. He's lost it. But he's going full time. I swapped my fancy Mercedes for a clapped out old Skyline. I put a Bible under my arm. And I set off to preach the gospel. And I remember, I think it was my last or second last day at the office. In my quiet time there at the office, I was saying, Lord... How come cricket, once such an obsession to me, is now so relatively unimportant? And I thought, well, the years had eaten that up. It was 12 years since I last played cricket. But what about the business world? I had to get to the top. I had to be the boss. I had to be in the business times. I had to be in all those things. I've just given it away. I've just given it. How come? How come? I've just given that away. And I really believe I got an answer. And the answer again was always a simple one. You had to go through all of that to get to here. How can you stand up and tell people 
that there's nothing at the top of the sports world except I allowed you to play in the greatest cricket side in your nation's history. How can you talk about the business world if you've never been there? You had to go through all of that to get to here. And you know, the amazing thing about that time was that it was exactly 40 years. 40 years in the wilderness. 40 years in the worldly wilderness, enjoying all the success and all the fame, to realizing and to have a true perspective on it all. Nothing happens glibly and quickly. And God doesn't waste anything. I'm full time in the ministry, living by faith, and I go to a place called Queenstown. And I'm doing a week long mission with Trevor Goddard. Trevor was the captain of the, of the Springbok side. In 1963-64, he got saved in 1970. He said that when he got saved, he took the 1963 cricket side and he, he put all the names and he used to pray for each one. And he used to go down in batting order and he got down to the bottom and he said, there was Peter Pollock and he used to say, Lord, sir, you got a tough one there. <laughs> and he said in his whole list, I was the only one that got saved. In his whole list, I was the only one. Anyway, the two of us teamed up, and we used to go and minister at schools. In those days, you could get into the schools, and we used to go for a week, and we were at, the, at Queen's College, and there were a whole lot of, of, of meetings for us. We had all the classes for a, a full period, and we could even do an altar call on the Friday. Things have changed considerably. But one of the things was what the junior school, the Queen's Junior School, with a lovely Christian Edmos, wanted a speaker. So he invited Trevor or I. And I want to tell you, we didn't want to hear that invitation. Because the two of us were petrified. You can give me a stadium with 100,000 people, and I think, but don't give me 21 kids. In a class, 21 kids of 8, 9 years old with an attention span of 21 seconds. Because that is, and the two of us were petrified. Who's going to do that? So he eventually pulled rank. I said, let's spin for it. He said, no. He says, you, you're the youngster. I was 60 and he was 70. He said, y y you're the youngster. And he said, you'll have to do it. So, okay, I'll go. And I got there with the headmaster, and the headmaster, he, he looks at me, and I, 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 I get introduced. I say, tell me, how long do I have to speak for? He says, 30 minutes. I said, Ooh. I said, that's a long time in a junior school. I said, now, what do you want me to speak about? So he said, the gospel. So I said, that makes it even longer. So he said, what did you want to do? I said, I was going to tell them some stories for 25 minutes because I'm good at telling stories. And then the last five minutes, I'll do the gospel. And he looked at me and he said, stories, stories, stories. He said, I am sick of stories. He said, everybody tells stories. Even the church today, they're telling stories. Stories. And stories don't help anyone. I want the gospel. I said, okay, okay. You're the boss. So he says, look, I'll make it easy for you. Get in there. Get up on the thing. Speak five minutes, ask question. Speak five minutes, ask question. That's why we will ensure they stay awake. So he obviously didn't have a lot of confidence in the speaker. So anyway, I get up there all on my own. And there's 700 little kids in front of me. In the front row are the little ones. They're that high. And they're standing there and they're standing up for the preacher. And the one little guy standing there, really cute, small like that. He's got freckles on his face. 
white face, big freckles, cut his own hair, the top sticking up, done his own tie, bottom too long, top too short, and he's standing there. And you know, as I looked at the little kids, it rather reminded me of Sunday school. We used to go to Sunday school at my Presbyterian, and once a month we used to go in the main service, and they used to march us into the front row, the front two rows. That's why they're empty these days. But they marched us to the front two rows. And they told us, because th those days, you walk in there, you couldn't laugh or talk or look left or right. You just had to go in there and you had to look. And there in front was just a big organ and you had to look. And if you start chatting or laughing, the ground will open up and pfft, you'll all disappear. So they didn't tell us that, but we, we, we sort of had heard this, those sort of stories, you see. So, so anyway, that rather reminded me. So I'm up there. And the little guy's there, so I think he's rather cute. So I speak for five minutes, and then I look at him and I say, Son, can I ask you a question? He said, Yes, sir. And with that, I asked him a question, a very unfair question, because I didn't even think about it. I needed the break, not him. So I said to him, Son, can you tell me about Jesus? He said, Yes, sir. He said, Jesus is the bestest guy ever. Now, I don't want to argue about the doctrinal value of that statement, but he says it in his little voice, and it doesn't carry too far. So I repeat it to the school. I said, this is what he said. Does anyone here agree with him? And the whole school put up their hands. In the, in the front, the little hands went up straight away. At the back, the older boys first had a team meeting, and then they all put up their hands. <laughs> Anyway, afterwards, I'm having tea with the headmaster. And I said to him, sure. I said, that was lovely. I came there here to bless the kids. But you really, like this, the school blessed me. It was such a privilege. He said, yeah, he said, it's, it's lovely. He said, I give them the gospel every day. But he said, you know what happens? He said, they leave my school. And they go into the high schools of this world. And there they get attacked by the scientism, the peer group pressure, all the intellectualism, all the humanism. They get attacked. The boys start chasing the girls, and the girls start chasing the boys. And he said, just the same way as they found out about Father Christmas and threw him away, and the Easter bunny and threw him away, and the tooth fairy and threw him away. He said, they've done the same with Jesus. He said, they'll argue that they haven't. They think they haven't. They can tell you that they go to church, but they've done the same with Jesus. He said, look. Look around. Look at the world. Look at the families. Look at the country. They've done the same with Jesus. And they don't want to hear it. And I thought, oh, so right. I thought of my, my grey days at a fancy school, at the grey high school, Christian school. It had a, 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 you know, fancy schools have fancy mo Latin mottos. The motto was tri juncta in you, know, three and one. I th used to think it was rugby, cricket and athletics. I later found out that it was mind, body and spirit. They did much for the mind and body. Maybe I can sue them for what never happened there spiritually. But we learned we, every morning we read from the Bible. Every morning we said a prayer. Every morning we sang a hymn. And we were taught about having a goal in life. Having a goal in life, setting yourself goals, ambition, all those things. But it had nothing to do we were just fed humanism because we weren't talking about goals and, 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 and running the race. I mean, the Bible says you must run the race to win. The Bible says you need to have a vision. My people perish. But we weren't in goals and visions. visions. We were in obsessions. Whether we want to believe it or not, we were caught up in the great American dream and not the original one, the modern American dream. You get born into the system. You get educated into the system. You climb the ladder in the system. And hopefully one day you're going to make enough money to have peace and fulfillment. 
No ways. It doesn't matter how much money. There's no ambition. It's just obsession. So obsession, you're so obsessed with becoming a, a, a springbok, so obsessed with making money, so obsessed with even building a church for Jesus. It's all obsession. We caught up. And whether you want to believe it or not, there we are. There we are. My dream was to be a springbok. To go to England and beat England in England. I always thought the English thought they knew everything about cricket. Best thing, beat them in England, then they can't complain about the umpires. That was my dream. 1965, we went there. We beat them in England. It was the start of five of the greatest years in South African cricket history. By 1970, we were number one side in the world. It's regarded as one of the greatest teams ever. It all started at Trent Bridge in 1965. We beat England in England. What a party. The champagne flowed, the beer flowed, telegrams from state president down. What a party we had. But you know, the next morning as we got in the bus to drive from Nottingham to London, if we'd been honest with ourselves, we'd have looked each other in the face and said, what's the big deal? Three weeks later, we arrived at Jan the then Jansmuts Airport. It was the early days of the Boeings. People used to go and watch Boeings take off and land. In Joburg, not a lot to do there. They went, oh, oh. We arrive home in this Boeing. The Boeing's given the right to come in low and do a victory loop. It just has a victory bank, but it makes us all sick in the process. We get out. There's no, there's no problem with, with security. We get out of the thing. We walk amongst the people, tens of thousands of them back snapping. Mind boggling. 24 years old, the heroes of the nation. We'd beaten England. We were on the way to the top. The heroes, 24 years old. But again, if we'd been honest with ourselves, what's the big deal? But you can't be honest with yourselves. You are the heroes and the icons. The kids attain. They seek to, to be like you. You can't stand up and put up your hand and say, but sir, something's missing. The emperor's got no clothes on. But that is the truth. I'm sorry. That is the truth. Like King Solomon, you get to understand that it's all a chasing after the wind. All the money in the world, the richest guy ever, the cleverest guy ever, comes to the conclusion, all has been said, here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God. And keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. I had a wonderful life. Really. When I think back, we were very fortunate. We never cheeked our parents. We were just brought up like that. You couldn't. If I cheap cheeked my mom, I'd have been in such trouble with my dad. And my mom and dad never used to fight in front of us. They used to go upstairs into the main bedroom, close the, the door, and my brother and I, we used to go and listen by the door. As I said, I went to a fancy school. Never cheeked, mom and dad. Honor your mother and father that it may go well with you. We didn't do that because it was a biblical thing. It was just part of the way we lived. That it may go well with you. Honor mother and father. It doesn't matter. Because God says so. Then I got married. I had a lovely wife, Ines. Really lovely wife. Four children. Two boys, two girls. Six grandchildren. When we first started playing cricket, we had a wonderful advantage over everyone else. We never paid for money. It was a privilege to play for the country. We used to have to take holiday to play for South Africa. Beat England in England. Beat Australia 4-0. 4-0. When I was in Australia, the one time I was finished, I'd preached. And one of the fathers had his son there and he said, it was Aussies. 
And he introduced his son to me. He said, you know, this is Peter Pollock. He was in the Springbok side that beat the Aussies 4-0. The little guy looks at me. He says, no ways. I mean, they have been so brainwashed. He had to Google it to find out that it had actually happened. 4-0, the best cricket side in the world. Fastest bowler in the world. Number one bowler in the world. World 11s, life member of the MCC, all that thing. Hockey, squash, bowls, all interprovincially. Confirm my lunacy running six comrades marathons. Journalism, business world, author, cricket, administrator. When I look back at my life, family and friends, and I look back at my life, if someone said to me, if you had your life all over again, what would you change? I would say, I'll have the same again. Now here is the perspective. That life, that whole life, paled into insignificance the day I met Jesus. That whole life paled into insignificance the day I met Jesus. And friends, that is the way it is if you've truly met Jesus Christ. I'm sorry. If you're battling to put him number one in, his, in your life, you have not met him. If there's no fear in, of God in your life, you haven't met him. If you haven't come to conviction on your wretchedness, you haven't met him. The pearl of great price once found, all else paled into insignificance. That is a truth. I'm sorry, it's not preached. We're happy just with the Sunday meeting. That's only a beginning. Mother Teresa said, you'll never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus Christ is all you got. You will never know until he's all you got. The evangelists had a great meeting. They had an altar call. Then they decided to pray for the sick. They wheel a guy up in a wheelchair. He comes up. Three guys pounce on him to pray for him. They pray and pray. Nothing happens. They raise their voice and nothing happens. And then the guy in the wheelchair starts to cry and the guy's praying for him. They thought they had offended him, so they step back. He said, no, you haven't offended me. These are tears of joy. He says, I'm so happy I haven't been healed out of this wheelchair. He said, do you know why? Because this wheelchair is the most priceless thing that I own. He said, do you know why? Because if I hadn't ended up in this wheelchair, I would never have found the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't need my legs. I have found the Christ. What a perspective. Most of us want to be healed out of the wheelchair that maybe we will think about thinking about Jesus. And then we wonder why nothing ever happens in our lives. Nothing's impossible for God. We look at that. Nothing's impossible for what God can do for me. It's got nothing to do that when that statement tells us how awesome He is. Not the capacity of what He can do for you. It's not about you and me. Never has been. The modern church has made far too much of a fuss of us. It's all about Jesus. Emlyn Jones, he was our pastor, the family pastor. Lovely Welshman had hair like this, like a halo. He loved singing, preaching. And he loved rugby and cricket. So he was the family pastor. 
And he used to do the christenings and the weddings. We didn't have too many funerals in those days. So, And our deal with him was that we would, Graham and I would supply him with tickets for the rugby tests and the cricket tests. So that was, we had a wonderful arrangement. Then I hadn't seen him for a long time, lost touch. And then Ines and I get born again. So I'm in Durban and I find out that he's now 90 years old, he's in his 90s. He's been in the ministry for 70 years and he's actually dying, he's in a hospice in Peter Marisburg. So we get in the car and we drive up to Marisburg. And I'll never forget, we went into his room, a little room, and there on a, on a, on a three-foot bed, he's lying on the bed, and as I move up to him, through his sort of watery, tired old eyes, he looks up and he recognizes me. And he says, to what do I owe this honor? So I said, Emlyn, Ines and I, we just want to tell you something. We're born again. And he looked up and he said, oh, the power of prayer. And I realized that for years and years he'd been praying for us. And then he said, he said, you know, when he first went into the ministry, which was like 70 years ago, he said he was going to, he had determined to deliver the greatest sermon in Presbyterian history. So he had it all set up for his debut. He said he got up into the pulpit. He said he just broke down and cried. And all he could do was tell the people why he was in the ministry. And he said he had only one reason for being in the ministry. His love for Jesus Christ. Very specific, his love for Jesus Christ. But he says his love for Jesus then was infinitesimal by comparison to his love for Jesus now. 70 years later. And then, and then he said to me that um, uh, he, he'd lived a, a long life and he said as he looks back on his life he says he's done some good things and some things not so good. But he says as he looks and he says that the, the longer he's lived the more he realizes how little he really knows. But he says, as I go to be with my Lord, he said, Peter, I can leave you with one absolute, one absolute truth. A lot of things have confused me. But the one truth I can leave you is that nothing, absolutely nothing in this world is worthwhile if you haven't met Jesus. He actually died the next day. That was his last words. Nothing. And friends, that is it. We somehow seem to be scared to say that. Nothing in this world. One day you are going to come to grips with that that absolutely nothing in this world is worthwhile without Jesus. Not religion, not Christianity, not any of those things, not spirituality, not any of those things. Jesus Christ. The gospel is the revelation of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It's not all the other things we have made. Just after I got saved, I wrote this little poem. The chasm of darkness, a canyon of fear, the hell of not knowing that Jesus is near. Reliance on wisdom, frustrating life's quest, missing all signposts, too clever to rest. The pride of endeavor, the grim selfish race, the almighty hurdles in seeking his face, those innermost slanders, the unbridled tongue, guilt planting fingers, the song has been sung. The list oh so endless, the agonies galore, no wonder this world is a festering sore. Some claim atrocity, others plead cause, but nobody is winning these meaningless wars. But fear not, you soldiers, your weapon is light. The two-edged sword that cuts day and night. The cross of Lord Jesus, he died in our place. So simple, the truth. So massive, 
God's grace. God's horse bowler. I know that everything that happened in my life was there for a platform to preach the gospel. Remember your first love, the height from which you have fallen. And I do believe that that's the plaintive, soul-searching cry of the Father heart of God. Your love has grown cold, a serious charge. Do you remember that excitement, that childlike helplessness, and that total reliance and confidence and expectation that you had in Jesus? Did you ever have it? Where do you stand with Jesus? That's all that counts. And I want to tell you that if there's any doubt in your mind, you haven't met him. Doubt is a ferocious enemy of faith. And it's not okay to doubt. It's not okay to doubt. It's from the pit of hell. Where do you stand with Jesus? It's experiential. Seek me and you will find me. I will reveal myself to you. If you look for me, I will reveal myself to you. Let's bow our heads. Lord, I just thank you for this time. I thank you for testimony. And the testimony is your testimony. It's actually not our testimony. And even as we read the, the Bible, we read all those testimonies and what you did. It's your testimony. The Bible is about you. It's not a, about Moses and David and Jeremiah and Isaiah. It's all about you. It's your revelation to us. And I pray, Lord, that in your special way here this morning, you know the state of every one of our hearts here. We can fool the world, we can even fool ourselves, but we can't fool you. And only you can speak into our hearts. Only you can go where the soul and spirit meets. And I pray, Lord, that you have challenged hearts. I pray that we have allowed you to do that. You, you actually give us the right by our own will, to block you out. But I pray that we've opened up to you this morning and allowed you to minister to us. I pray our hearts have been soft to receive. And I pray that we're going to do something about it. And if you've been challenged for whatever reason, commitment, recommitment, whatever, I'm going to say a simple prayer. A prayer of commitment, it might be a recommitment, whatever. But if you have been challenged in any way, for whatever reason, in the silence of your hearts, say this prayer after me, meaning every word and knowing that for whatever reason God has spoken to you, He will meet you right where you are. Not because I say so, but because His word promises us that. You want to leave here this morning never to be the same again in the silence of your hearts. Say this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I just come to you as I am. I believe that you're the Son of God and I believe that you died very specially for me. Thank you. I confess that I'm a sinner. I repent. I turn my back on my old life, albeit a religious old life, and I look to you. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Take charge of my life and set my spirit free. 
I love you, Jesus, with all my heart and soul and mind and strength. Thank you for the way you've made me. Thank you for skills and talents you've given me. Show me, Lord, how to use them to your glory. I receive you right now. I never want to be the same again. Take your glory in my life. Take your glory. Lord, I pray. I pray that you have spoken into every heart. I pray that you've touched every heart here this morning. And I pray with each and every one of us, we will leave here never to be the same again. And I pray for this fellowship that you may truly take your glory and that you may be glorified in everything that is said and done in this place. Amen and amen. Bless you all.